You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down the threats and vulnerabilities, solving some of the hard problems and protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. It is my pleasure to welcome to the Research Saturday podcast, Johannes Ulrich. He is the Dean of Research at the SANS Technology Institute and also the host of the daily SANS Internet Storm Center podcast. <laughs> Wait, so let me get that right. It is the ISC Storm Center podcast. And Johannes, you and I joke about this because for whatever reason, I always want to say ICS. Which is <laughs> Lots wrong. of people do that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's one of my pet peeves when people say yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to get it right for you. So welcome. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. So uh, we're going to do something a little different than we typically do on Research Saturday today. We're going to dig into some of the history of uh, SANS as a cyber research organization, and then also talk about some of the process that you and your colleagues use there. Uh, where would you like to get started? Well, uh, in the beginning, I guess, yeah, uh, one reason I think it's nice to talk about this is it actually started 25 years ago, and you're not too many things in information security are that old and have survived for that long. Yeah. But uh, it actually originally started in 99. And you know, for the young kids listening, there was something called a Y2K that actually sort of sparked it all, where uh, San sort of said, hey, you know, we probably should get better at exchanging what we are seeing in our environments. And Y2K sort of gave the spark to it, but uh, then people found it really helpful to have a place where you can report what you're seeing, where uh, you can talk about some of your observation in your environment, and that sort of then evolved into what's now Internet Storm Center. And what was it like in those early days? Are, are we talking about you know message boards? Are we talking about blog posts? What, what was it? Well, actually, one reason we still call it a diary today, what we are writing sort of each day, is the term blog didn't exist back then. Mm. And so, and it was sort of a message board. It was emails coming in. We had our handler on duty. We sort of still use some of that language today, uh, who would receive all these messages and then sort of compile a little digest uh, that would then be posted in this uh, diary format. Was it bi-directional? I mean, would, could people get feedback? Yeah, and actually, that's something that still uh, works quite well uh, today sometimes. When we do post something like, hey, you know, we received an email where someone reported something odd in the environment, and then others are sort of chiming in and reporting why they may be seeing that or uh, some of the background about that particular software. And uh, so sort of that community aspect of it uh, really was developed then very early on. Yeah. Well, let's walk through the evolution then. I mean, how, how have things changed over the years? Yeah, so, um, and actually that 99 was a little bit before I started uh, working with SANS and uh, working in that Storm Center. Uh, by myself, uh, I sort of started setting up a little bit of a similar system, but more automated, where I basically, with a couple of friends, started collecting our firewall logs, uh, analyzing them, uh, creating some graphic representations of those logs, which um, sort of started in 2000, so like a year after SANS started its system. And uh, it came really handy, if you remember, like 2000, 2001, when these early worms came out, uh, where we really had some great data to uh, then uh, reflect how these worms spread, how fast they spread, where they started. 
So uh, these firewall logs back then uh, were what we collected. And, uh, well, uh, people liked it. Uh, we got a ton of people that were then willing to submit their logs to the system. The nice thing was the original SAN system was sort of more manual process I described it. People writing in and uh, people analyzing it and uh, posting about it. Uh, that's a slower process. Uh, these automated systems allowed us to speed all of that up. And of course, the two then start feeding each other. That's you know, when I then started uh, working with SANS and also then maybe sort of officially then named it the Internet Storm Center. You know, my brain short circuits a little bit when I think about 1999 being 25 years ago. Uh, I don't know how, how you feel about that, yeah. but uh, <laughs> can you give us an idea of what the community was like back then? I mean, cybersecurity itself was was different than it is today. It was very different. Uh, like, for example, one parameter of your tracking is what we call the survival time. And uh, that's how long it takes between sort of unsolicited packets re being received by your system, by sort of an average home system. Uh, we'll call it an attack. And uh, back then, uh, that time was about 15 minutes. Hmm. Uh, after the initial warm started, sort of in 2001-ish, uh, that shrank down to about five minutes Later, in particular ones, Mirai and some of these really aggressive scanning bots started. Well, uh, we are now well below one minute, uh, sort of between unsolicited packets hitting a random IP address on the internet. Are there any specific, I guess, milestones along the way that, that stand out to you in terms of you know, either the, the growth and evolution of uh, the Storm Center or also the, the growth and evolution of the internet itself? Yeah, I think sort of a little bit the evolution of the threats over the years uh, is one of those things. Like I mentioned, initially, we started uh, collecting firewall logs. And uh, that was really interesting back then uh, because you know, we had bots like uh, Nimda, if anybody remembers that, uh, which sort of hit the uh, IS on port 80. We had the Blastor Worm, which uh, hit port 135 back in the day. Over the years, that changed. Uh, these days much of the attacks we're seeing are web application attacks, uh, which basically hit your standard web ports like 80, 8,000, and so on. So as the initial firewall logs we collected became less telling as to what the actual threat is, uh, we had to adapt. And uh, we adapted to sort of more complete honeypots to collect our data. Uh, so where we now set up honeypots that are collecting data from SSH server, from Telnet server. So that's like your Mirai-style attacks. Uh, we have honeypots that are emulating different web applications. So this is all the different web attacks. That really now, uh, first of all, tells us more detail about these attacks, uh, or what they're all about, what they're after. Uh, but then again, we, we have to sort of uh, keep up with the attacks Later, uh, and uh, these days, many of the interesting attacks, they first check if your system is actually vulnerable. And uh, that then, sort of about uh, five to ten years ago, we started experimenting with what we call an agile honeypot, where uh, the honeypot is able to emulate different applications, different devices. So you know, that's sort of as attacks against IoT devices started. That sort of you know, helped us then gain a little bit more insight into those attacks that we're seeing these days where... A lot of it, uh, I mentioned already Mirai a couple of times, uh, are sometimes attacking very specific sort of routers or devices. I always uh, joke that, hey, we can turn our honeypots into toasters if that's what's being attacked today. <laughs> now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. 
Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Was there much thought given in those early days about scalability? Like, were people imagining that the internet would be so interleaved into our lives the way it is? Uh, I think some people were sort of imagining it. I certainly kind of believed in that. You know, that sort of got me stuck with it. But I think mm. overall, I would say, you know, back in the early days, uh, the internet was a much nicer place, kind of. You know, people helped each other a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And um, that in some ways got me into security. Uh, like, you know, one of the early instances that I sort of had to deal with in my personal system was setting up a Linux system, which back then, and again, we're talking like, you know, late 90s, had an open mail relay by default. Mm. And that's just how we rolled back then. You set up right. mail servers just for <laughs> right. everybody to send email with. And, and of course, right. so that was then when spammers started coming up and started abusing <laughs> uh, those uh, those mail servers. So, And I think the security community was also smaller. And in that sense, uh, I think there was more trust than there's now more collaboration. I would say collaboration a lot depends on sort of you know, people collaborate with other it's not organizations collaborating with each other. That personal connection, I think, uh, happened probably more back then than it does now. Yeah. Can you speak to that transformation where it has kind of become corporatized these days? I mean, you have the big players. Um, there are still individuals who are known by name, and, and I would put you in that category, but so much is... is uh, you know, um, you know, Mandiant says, or Microsoft says, or you know, the the big names come out with their research. Correct, and uh, I think at the end of Storms, we try to sort of still follow a little bit that old uh, model. Like all of our honeypots are run by volunteers. Uh, we have uh, um, some as individuals at corporations sort of donates significant resources, like IP address space and such, to our honeypots and to the effort overall. Also, a lot of the analysis uh, we do is sort of done uh, by volunteers. Well, let's fast forward to today. I mean, what does it look like nowadays? What, what sort of processes do you all have in place? So uh, these days, we heavily rely on our uh, on our web application logs, uh, in some sense also on some of the talent SH logs, maybe not as much as we should uh, these days. But uh, all of these logs are being reported by these honeypots, which usually run on Raspberry Pis. That's sort of our preferred platform. We have uh, virtual systems that people are using uh, to, uh, to set up these honeypots, some like in various cloud providers. They send all of these logs to our database. We add them to the database. And then one of the unique things that we offer is essentially real-time. These logs are being turned around via our website. Everybody can look at them, can see what's new, what's interesting. Uh, we do have actually now some interns that help us uh, from our undergraduate uh, program that also run honeypots, help us develop the software and test it, and uh, also alert us of some new attacks that may be seen. Can you give us some examples of some of the more interesting items that you and your colleagues there have been researching lately? Yeah, uh, just today earlier, I was working on uh, Atlassian, uh, Atlassian Confluence, they patched a vulnerability uh, last week. On Monday, I saw in our, we have a report that you can also see on our website. I call it the first seen URL report, where it basically lists, hey, these are web application attacks that we saw today that we hadn't seen before. And uh, one of the URLs that sort of popped up there was related to the Atlassian attack. Then uh, I was able to actually emulate that particular software in a subset of our honeypots. That's sort of where the agile part comes in. And uh, then sort of collect more data about these attacks, so what people were trying to do with, with those servers. And, and then again, sort of immediately turn it around, uh, publish something about it, put up a quick summary about what we're seeing. Uh, but uh, again, the data was already there for everybody else to see. So our diaries, as we call them, these blog posts, are really just summarizing the data that we have. Uh, that's at least part of what we're doing there. 
What goes into being an, an effective researcher here? The, the folks that you work with, you, yourself you know, included, what are those personality elements, the, the areas of curiosity that, that seem to work out? I think curiosity is really it, uh, kind of. And then being willing to experiment, uh, being willing to be wrong sometimes. <laughs> and that's, uh, of course, not... I think something where things may have changed a little bit from the early days, but the social media environment these days can be a little bit unforgiving in that respect. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, being wrong in the sense, hey, if you're wrong, someone else will tell you why you're wrong and uh, what the real answer is. Also being willing to listen to those people that tell you that you're wrong. Uh, I think that's that's important. It sometimes helps to have a little bit of memory of what happened before. Surely not remembering all the different attacks that I've seen over the years. Uh, but uh, I see a lot of re-reporting of attacks too. That's sometimes a little bit annoying. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And sometimes I would imagine, speaking to that memory component, you you probably just get a funny feeling like something's amiss here, but you can't quite put your finger on it. That's correct. And uh, also seeing like, no, what's different, what's new. That's really sort of sometimes the important thing and the, the, the definitive part to figure out. Uh, also, you know, being willing to just plain experiment, uh, basically being wrong. A, a boss once told me in a prior job that the important part is to make the right number of mistakes, kind of. Mm. Uh, if you if you don't make mistakes, uh, you just uh, aren't really uh, brave enough to try something new, try something different. I think that's important as a researcher to make those mistakes and learn from it. What are your recommendations for somebody who's coming up in the industry? You know, I, either a student or maybe somebody considering a career change, the types of things that they can do to prepare themselves if, if this sort of research is something they think they're going to be interested in. Now, this may be a little bit very specific device, but uh, advice, but uh, setting up a honeypot. We had real great success with our undergraduate students who did it and then realized, hey, these are actual attacks I'm seeing here. Because... When you're reading about it, even when you're studying about in a classroom environment, maybe you're running some exercise around an attack, it's all sort of fairly sterile and artificial. If you actually see a simple, warm kind of, you know, hitting your honeypot, exploiting some of these vulnerabilities that you talked about in class, I think that makes it much more real and brings it really home to people. And it's relatively easy from a technical point of view to sort of get started with that. Of course, I'm biased here, but I thought that uh, I saw really a lot of uh, people's eyes light up sort of the first time they really saw these attacks uh, hitting their systems. Do you find that, that folks can be kind of intimidated by that, you know, sort of playing with live fire, if you will? Yeah, uh, uh, that certainly happens. And you know, maybe that's also important for them to realize that uh, how frequent these attacks are. Also, how many of these attacks really don't matter. Uh, we had recently this famous statement from some bank executives and how they're being attacked like a billion times a day and such. Uh, and some security people made sort of fun of that statement. It's real. They are being attacked that way that many times. But most of these attacks don't matter. They don't cause any damage. And that's in particular if you're sort of starting out from the defensive side, from like a software developer or a network uh, administrator point of view. Your goal is these five nines or, you know, this high reliability, everything has to work. Uh, you sometimes have to switch mindsets when you're talking about attacks where you're just saying that, uh, hey, uh, you know, for an attacker, it's perfectly fine if 99.99% of their attacks don't work. If the one attack works that breaks into the Fortune 500 you know, research department and gets you all their secrets, it was a good attack. Mm. It kind of reminds me of you know our, our own immune systems where you know it, most of the time it's just running there, fending things off, and we don't think twice about it. It just takes care of its business on its own, and we don't even notice. But then every now and then something gets through, and you know you could get a cold or you could get something more serious. Yeah, and that's sort of the important task of the researcher to find those new and different things, but you have to adjust your immune system uh, where you actually have to build these new cap capabilities to defend against this new attack. And the danger is, of course, from sort of, you know, someone who is in the business like me for a while to sort of get a little bit, uh, you know, dull over time or 
uh, you sort of stop caring really to some extent. Right. <laughs> um, and balance that with the new person who is getting excited about every little attack that's coming in. And I've seen both work. And really, that's why you sort of need that diversity also in your security teams where you uh, still have you know, someone that's new to it that still gets excited about some attacks. Because sometimes they find some interesting things because they do that research. They do actually dig in and see, hey, what is this attack doing? Yeah. Right. Well, Johannes Ulrich is the Dean of Research at the Sands Technology Institute, and he is also the host of the ISC Stormcast podcast. Johannes, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. And now a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. The Cyberwire Research Saturday podcast is a production of N2K Networks. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producers are Jennifer Iben and Brandon Karpf. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next time.